David Horner, welcome to ASPE. Thanks very much. What was Venona, the, in, the intercepts, and why did Venona lead to the creation of ASIO? Well, during the early 1940s and into the mid-1940s, the Americans, assisted by the British, managed to intercept and crack the ciphers used by the KGB, the Soviet Intelligence Service, between their headquarters in Moscow and the various embassies around the world. And when they looked at the communications between Canberra and Moscow, they found that there was espionage going on in Australia. Members of the Communist Party were passing information to the, uh, the, the Soviet Embassy. And this meant that intelligence that came from the Americans to Australia could then be leaked to the Soviets. And other information, such as the, uh, uh, the, the atomic uh, um, tests that were being, being planned in Australia, and so on. And so the Americans said that they could not share information with Australia. Uh, Australia would be insecure. They told the British, and the British came to Australia to tell the Australian government that they had to do something about these, uh, these leaks. The problem was that the, the whole system of, of in intercepting the communications, the Venona program as it was known, was so top secret that nobody in Australia knew about it or was allowed to know about it. So during 1948, the, uh, the, the British tried to persuade the Australians to set up a new security organisation to try to track down the people who are leaking this information and then to stop further espionage. But what really galvanised the Australians was that the United States was essentially cutting them out of the loop, was refusing to give any information to Australia. Oh, that's right, yes. So, uh, and, and we didn't know why. Suddenly we were being cut out of the intelligence loop. And uh, that meant that the whole basis of Australian defence policy would be uh, un under threat. Uh, how can you cooperate with uh, another country that's not willing to share information with you? So uh, uh, that led eventually to the Chifley Labor government setting up this new security organisation, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, in March 1949. So I said to do two things, to try to catch the spies and to make sure that our security arrangements were, were as good as they could be. And the problem with catching the spies was that these cables that were deciphered had code names for the spies, but they didn't necessarily have the spies' names. So we had to work backwards to try and work out who the spies were. It's a strange duality in a way. Australia sets up a domestic intelligence security organisation in many ways for international relations purposes. Oh, that, that, is, that is quite right, yes. Uh, and that, that is a, 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 a curious twist on this. And I called my book The Spy Catchers to make clear that the book was about catching spies, the, the, the new organisation was about catching spies. Uh, any other things that happened later on were, were, were subsidiary to that. And, and of course, spies are about passing on information and the information that the, that the spies were passing on was information that had been shared uh, by uh, Britain and America with Australia. So there's an international aspect to it right from the beginning. Australia is often referred to the intelligence relationship with the United States particularly as the crown jewels, the, 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 almost the central asset in many ways for Australian defence. So was ASIO part of the price Australia had to pay for this intelligence sharing relationship with the US, Britain, Canada and New Zealand? Well, undoubtedly. After the Second World War, the, there was a, an intelligence uh, arrangement made between Britain, Australia, the United States uh, uh, and Canada to share signals intelligence. Signals intelligence is the cracking of codes and the, and the gathering of information. This grew out of the wartime relationship and this was uh, the wartime uh, signals intelligence was really secret and so was the post-war uh, uh, information secret. And so we were part of that organisation set up in 1946-1947 but we could only remain part of that organisation if the other countries could be satisfied that our procedures would be secure in Australia. Would Australia have got the ANZUS alliance, the military alliance with the United States, if it hadn't acted on creating ASIO? That's an interesting question about whether we would have got ANZUS 
or not. And there, and there are a few moving parts in this, if you, if you can put it that way. The first one is that uh, in December 1949, the, the government changed. It went from, from the Chifley government, which was uh, suspected by the Americans as being le very left-leaning. There's not no suspicion that Chifley himself was, uh, was, was, was a communist, but, the, but there were suspicions about members of that government. So when the government changed, we had the, the Liberal government led by um, Robert Menzies, so already we were in a much better uh, shape. Uh, but uh, again, the Americans had to be satisfied that our security uh, uh, procedures were sufficient. And, and once they were satisfied about that, two things happened, of course. The, ASIO established and the change of government, then the Americans during, the, during 1950 were starting to share information with us and that made it much easier for us to have an alliance with the United States. The American suspicions of Australia, they took a long time to, to, to dissipate. Uh, the Americans at one stage in '48 were putting Australia on the same security level as India and Pakistan and it took a long time before the Americans were prepared to share intelligence with Australia's Department of External Affairs because it saw external affairs as leaking. In that atmosphere, would getting the alliance have been harder or, more, or impossible without ASIA? Oh, oh I, I think that would be that'd be right to say, yes, it would have been very much harder, yeah, perhaps impossible, without some sort of organisation such as ASIO to make the Americans and the British much more comfortable that we could protect the uh, the secrets, and of course, when the the Menzies government came to power, the secrets didn't didn't immediately flow. Uh, they gradually were cranked up over a period uh, during 1950, 1951, as uh, and remember the Korean War was on, so we were serving with the the British and the Americans, and so that the British and the Americans had to share, at least share some information with us. So that, that's another important aspect in the, the ANZUS alliance, is that we were fighting in Korea alongside them as well. So there, there are quite a few aspects to this, but the, 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 the Americans being comfortable about our security of, our, of the intelligence was a very, very important factor in it. In the book you quote Australia's former Labor leader, Kim Beasley, now our ambassador in Washington, uh, and Beasley says that the creation of ASIO was the most important single government action aligning Australia with the West in the Cold War. Was ASIO when Australia signed up to the Cold War? Um, the, 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 n not quite, but almost. Uh, you, you remember that Chifley went to um, uh, Britain in July 1948. He was going there to discuss economic matters, but when he got there, the, the British wanted to discuss intelligence matters and, and, and this, that was part of the step that led to, to ASIO. But also while they were there, the, the British made sure they took him across to um, Berlin to have a look at what was going on with the Berlin airlift and uh, Chifley decided that well, we should, we should be part of that as well. So uh, the aligning of Australia with, with the, uh, the Western Alliance during the Cold War was really underway during 1948. So there are a series of steps. So we have the the, um, uh, uh, the supporting of the uh, of, of the Berlin uh, the, the the planes going in for the Berlin blockade, and then we have ASIO, um, and, and of course the Cold War cranks up with in this period, all sorts of things happening around the world, and remembering too that Australian policy is made in two areas, we have policy made in the Department of External Affairs under Doc Ebert a much more internationalist approach. And then we have policy being made by the Department of Defence, Secretary Frederick Shedden getting into the ear of the Prime Minister, and that, that side of the policy making would be much more uh, aligned to wanting to be part of the Western Alliance. So ASIO in that sense injecting a, a new or a, a, a broader Cold War element into the way Australia thought about its own policies and about the world? Oh, oh, oh yes, so it moves the whole uh, security business from the, the, the very um, uh, low level uh, approach being taken by the old Commonwealth Investigation Service onto a much higher plane with the, with the, with the establishment of ASIO. And of course, while ASIO was established to catch spies, it takes several steps to think this one through. But the spies are coming from the Communist Party. Therefore, you have to keep members of the Communist Party out of the government departments uh, where they might have access to classified information. 
Therefore, you have to watch the communists and, the, and, and front organisations to find out who are the communists. And then you have to have a vetting system set up to make sure that they don't get into the government departments. So you have a whole structure that is established uh, by the establishment of ASIO. The line that you quote from Robert Menzies, Prime Minister Menzies, that ASIO became the fourth arm of defence with Army, Navy and Air Force, how broadly accepted was that within the government, that, that view of ASIO? Oh, that was a, that was a very, very strongly um, accepted and understood, particularly as we get into that Cold War period. If we go to war with the Soviet Union, then uh, there will be people in Australia supporting the Soviet Union, and therefore we have to, uh, to, to, to keep a watch on those and be ready to round them up. That's the job of ASIO. So ASIO very quickly becomes a key part of the, of the government, uh, government administration, uh, alongside Army, Navy and the Air Force. David Horner, thank you.